Today we're going to look at the 2017 Victorian State Budget. Uh, there's been a number of changes there, most importantly around stamp duty that are going to affect anybody that's going to invest or buy property. The main thing is off the plan stamp duty savings are abolished as of the 1st of July 2017. Previously in Victoria, the um, amount of stamp duty that you paid on a property that was off the plan was not on the contract price. What I mean by that is if you purchased house and land for $700,000, you pay stamp duty on $700,000 worth of house and land. That's the contract price. If you buy an off the plan apartment for $700,000, where it hasn't yet been built, it's gonna be built over the next year or two, you only paid stamp duty on the unimproved value of the property. So particularly where it's a high rise property, this had substantial stamp duty savings because your apartment probably only equated to a very, very small piece of the land that was going to be underneath the building. So it was normally three or $4,000 in stamp duty rather than 30 or $40,000 in stamp duty. Unfortunately now, uh, the stamp duty is similar to most other states. It's on the full contract value. There is one exception though, and that is first home buyers are accepted out of, um, out of that. They still get the stamp duty savings brought down onto the unimproved value. So that's going to bring apartment uh, sales in line with normal, uh, normal properties going, going forward. The other nasty one that was in the budget was that stamp duty was going up on the purchase of new motor vehicles. And that stamp duty is going up from 3.2% to 4.2%. This means that increase will add $500 to the price of a new car. If you were lucky enough to buy before the 30th of June 2017, you potentially saved $500 or whatever the value of your motor vehicle was. But going forward, we have got that increase on the motor vehicle. Payroll tax is another area that's also um, under review. It won't change for 2018, but for 2019 financial year, the actual threshold will go up from $575,000 to $650,000. Payroll tax is a tax levied on employers that have a total payroll of more than that threshold amount. So at the current level of $575,000, if your payroll is at 575, you pay no payroll tax. If you're actually at 675,000, i.e. you're $100,000 over that threshold, you need to pay an additional 4.85% in payroll tax on that $100,000. So it's gonna cost you another $4,850. And this is an increasing cost as your practice gets larger and larger. In some circumstances, contracting dentists that you employ will also be included in this payroll threshold and the payroll threshold includes not only employee wages, but the superannuation that you pay on their behalf. So if you actually engage the services of a spouse and you're paying them a wage and doing the maximum superannuation, you can quite quickly get over that $575,000 threshold, even in a fairly small dental practice. It's one of the areas that the major corporates all look at and it's one of the reasons why they often use the gross up method that I spoke about in an earlier episode. There's also stamp duty exemptions on property transfers between spouses that is going to uh, not exist anymore after the 30th of June 2017. Previously, if there was a, um, uh, a transfer, between husband and, and wife, that property transfer could occur without any stamp duty. Now that will only apply for the family home. 
The problem with this is, is that quite often an investment property will be purchased in the name of the high income earner. It's purchased in the name of the high income earner to take the maximum advantage of negative gearing and all of those tax benefits. Obviously, over a period of time, that property becomes less negatively geared as some of the loan gets paid off and as rents rise. So at that point in time, it's then often considered appropriate to transfer that property to the lower income earning spouse in the family and therefore the positive gearing or the positive rental then flows to that person. We will no longer be able to do that where it is in fact an investment property. And we will need to take care where we've got a situation of the family home, which quite often may be debt free or fairly low, and someone moving to a new family home and wanting to retain the old one as an investment property. We would often do a transfer between spouses and try and re-gear that property so that we get some negative gearing advantages. This is going to need some careful planning so that we can do the transfer potentially stamp duty free if we do it while it still remains the family home and before it becomes an investment property. Also, for first home buyers, the stamp duty has been abolished where the purchase price for that property is below $600,000. That is not a absolute clear line threshold. Um, it actually gets shaded in between $600,000 and $750,000. So there still are some potential savings for first home buyers, even if that property is over the $600,000 mark. So all of those uh, issues mean that property investors really need to get advice whenever they are looking at buying, transferring, selling, or incorporating negative gearing into their wealth creation strategies. Thank you. Hi Albert, it sounds like that there's been some significant changes to the state budget. Are there any changes to the First Home Buyers Grant? Yes, there have been for those people that are buying in regional areas. So if you sign a contract or purchase a home after the 30th of June 2017, the first home buyer's grant has gone up from $10,000 to $20,000 per eligible home. I've heard that there are some payroll tax concessions for businesses in regional areas. Would you mind telling us what they are? Uh, yes, the changes are that the payroll tax rate in Victoria will fall from 4.85% to 3.65%, which is a reasonably significant saving, and that's for anyone that's in a regional area. You must note though, that 85% of your employees or contracting dentists must be in that regional area. So you can't just put someone out in the middle of nowhere and claim it on all your employees. You must be a legitimate regional business. Okay, now this question is in relation to off the plan apartments. So if a dentist is buying an apartment as a family home, but they're not eligible for the first home buyer's grant, would they still be subject to stamp duty? I know that would probably be common for some uh, dentists who are older and may be downsizing, but buying a nice apartment in a city or in a suburban, uh, suburban area. Uh, they will in fact still be able to apply to have the stamp duty on the old rules, which is technically the unimproved value of that property and not the full contract value. So yes, if it's going to be their family home and they do in fact use it as their principal residence, they will get the old stamp duty savings.
Thanks for listening. As you can quite clearly understand, this episode had a lot of detail in it and there are a lot of complex issues that you need to understand with respect to buying a property. Obviously buying a property is one of the biggest investments that you'll make and you may buy multiple properties. So it's really important that you get in touch with us and to make sure that the transaction is carried out correctly and that you don't accidentally get caught with expenses that maybe you don't need to take. Also, stay tuned and look out for our next episode. We're going to look at one of the other areas that concerns most dentists, and that is the claim for their motor vehicle. That's something that everyone needs to ensure they have absolutely maximised, and you'll also find out why you should never buy your motor vehicle in the company name.